Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Wall Street Wildlife Podcast. We've got three big questions we're tackling today. Christoph, you made an NVIDIA trade. We're going to answer the question, is AI a sustainable investing trend? We're also going to talk about an essential process to improve your investing gains because my buddy, the Badger, is doing some ongoing live portfolio reviewing and it's really, really key to his, uh, to his gains and his process. So check it out. And our last big question for today's episode is, what's the latest tool in the hacker's arsenal and why does this make cyber security the most durable and important investing trend of this decade i'm luke the badger hallard my buddy is christoph monkey pikarski and this is the wall street wildlife podcast all right badger so first up to conclude our uh, nvidia discussion from last week or is it two weeks ago two weeks ago maybe now we made a bet based on nvidia's earnings mm-hmm. and i confess that i bought one share of NVIDIA pre-earnings. <laughs> you took the, uh, you've, you've doubled, you took the whiskey bet, uh, the whiskey money essentially, and you've rolled it into NVIDIA shares. By the way, that's not to say I'm about to spend $674 on whiskey for you when we meet up in Austin in a few weeks time. Oh, we, we shall see. <laughs> it depends <laughs> on the kind of whiskey we're drinking. So I bought the share pre-earnings at 674 holding my nose because anyone following this story knows that NVIDIA's stock price has been absolutely atmospheric. So at the start of the year, NVIDIA was around 490. It is now 870. And it nearly pipped up above a thousand bucks. So it's come back down to 870. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it was close. Yeah, it was close to a thousand. So point being is that I bought a share at 674. And I sold it, uh, I, I think on Friday or uh, at 9.55 for a 42% gain mm-hmm. in an already gigantic mega cap. Gigantic, I think it's the fourth largest asset in the world now at uh, 2 trillion something. So yeah. to gain 42% in value of an already gigantic asset makes me made me really really doubt the extent to which this is sustainable and so in order i mean so i sold that's what i did i'm voting with my dollars i'm saying that that it's just gotten completely out ahead of itself so you, today you have no you own no nvidia today correct so i no longer have any nvidia but I think you rightly said in our discussion before we started recording, uh, that kind of short-termism is not what long-term investors do. And, um, you know, going just hopping in and hopping out. But what, you know, I'm thinking to myself, what can I do that's imp- that has some value? And I decided to really look, tr- try to better understand AI as a general concept. Because the more secure I could be in my knowledge and understanding of what this thing is, the less likely I'll be to hold into something that's just a fad or uh, sell. selling will be appropriate if it is, in fact, you know, problematic on whatever foundational levels. Yesterday uh, was the Oscars and uh, the best picture, Oppenheimer, won pretty much everything. To me, that's a story that's analogous to to what's happening with AI. You have discrete groups of people who are devoting their lives, some of the smartest people in the world, to building something that was never built before. And I think the question for many people at this moment is, you know, what are the foundations of this thing? What are the costs? What are the dangers? Is this real? And so in in, um, shout out to this book, The Maniac, by Benjamin Rabatou, for those of you who have not heard of it. It's a story of essentially the birth, the seeds of AI, starting with uh, the biopic of Johnny Von Neumann, who is considered the smartest person of the 20th century, and he in part invented computers and game theory and worked on the atomic bomb 
um, at Los Alamos. But the second half of the book takes those beginnings, his beginning theories of an emergent intelligence, and fast forwards us to the time of Alpha Go defeating the world's best Go player, which is you know a shocking event for humanity because it seemed like uh, a new kind of intelligence was born. And, and actually, interestingly, I think that was almost eight years ago today when Lee Sedol got beaten by AlphaGo, and the world has moved on significantly even since then. Yeah, so um, the next thing I did, Badger, is I think you did too. You listened to a conversation on the Lex Friedman podcast with the chief AI scientist over at Meta. And I yeah, wanted Jan, to... Jan Lecum talking about his views on AI and like perhaps the limitations of large language models. Very interesting. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I'm not sure what I'm left with. I'm not sure what conclusions I'm left with other than it seems to me that on the one hand, there's a form of AI that you could see in Go that I think currently NVIDIA and all other graphics cards are enabling that has immense power to, for example, win at Go, immense beyond what we thought, but it does not seem to me that that is translating or will translate anytime soon to the kind of general AI, AGI, that might disrupt all kinds of industries. Uh, I, would, I would argue it doesn't need to, right? Mm -hmm. So like LLMs, if you're playing with things like Gemini and ChatGPT and Perplexity AI and Claude and all these different systems, like they have incredible value to me right now and to lots of industries. And maybe later this episode, we'll talk about a little bit about how even hackers are using these tools to make their lives easier. Um, for good or bad, they're making all companies a, a, a more efficient. Good example, uh, private Swedish buy now, pay later company Klarna had a press release just a couple of weeks ago, I think, where they said they were using an open AI powered chatbot to do the work of 700 call center agents. So you got like, there's a little bit of skepticism around that claim, but certainly you've got like a real company generating real dollar value operational efficiency because they're using these tools not necessarily to displace people but to make people operate make their humans operate at a higher level and so that's just great for all companies and you know if and if comp if if like the companies using the tools are saving money or making more money well that's going to translate into more money for the companies like nvidia creating the capabilities for these tools that all sounds legit and correct I think the worry I'm left with is around commodification. It does seem like some of the foundations are that learning language models are already really, really, really good. They're going to get better, but now we're playing with a limited da data set and, uh, and the market is forward looking. And so when I see a spike in NVIDIA's price that is already exponential, I'm sorry, not exponentially, but, but it's, it's magnitudes, orders of magnitude to get from 223 to almost 1,000. That's a 5x. Well, let's put it in real numbers because like the share price is just like a made up number. Like this is a $2 trillion company. Like yeah, right. Like, can it can it become a three trillion, a ten trillion dollar company? You know, at some point, we run into the limits of like our ability to monetize this stuff. Right. I, I, th there's a limit to how many chips I think foundationally need to be employed in this kind of stock price, meaning the two million the two trillion market cap, I think suggests to me that the market thinks these kinds of sales will continue in perpetuity. Whereas what I'm, what I'm really trying to parse out is to what extent is this analogous to what happened with the birth of the internet? And I think my conclusion, sorry, this is messy because it's a messy, it's an unknown where, you know, like the atomic bomb building in, in the fifties, this is new terrain for humanity. And the reason I sold my share shares of NVIDIA is I think the market has gotten way, way ahead of itself 
predicting that this kind of growth will go on for a very, very long time. I don't see it. I think it could. Like whether it's NVIDIA or whether it's other companies in the same ecosystem, like Taiwan Semiconductor, like ASML, like some of the other companies, like the hyperscalers, like Google and Amazon, building their own hardware as well. I think this is like a relentless growth from here because we're only literally only just taking our first steps in realizing like actual operation, like actual effic true efficiencies from these tools. Mm -hmm. Like here, that, you know, that Klarna example I just gave, that's one of the first press releases we've actually seen where a company's claiming we've made a saving, like we've saved 700 headcount in our organization. And I think that's like the beginning of a wave where we're going to see many, many stories like that as companies start to implement these tools. I'll, if if you'll allow me a little bit of the philosophizing just for for 30 seconds, it's a worrisome time, I think, from the perspective of what the best picture Oppenheimer revealed to us, that when we're playing with an incredibly new and powerful technology, there's a non-zero chance that the world might blow up. <laughs> I, to me, that was the most terrifying thing about that film and maybe why it, it won Best Picture. And yet, humans do it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In other words, that's part of the lesson of the maniac in, in this film. Like, we are the kinds of creatures who can't help themselves. If it's there for us to monkey with, we're going to monkey with it, even if it might blow up the world. What gives me pause about, I guess, NVIDIA's rise, the meteoric rise, is that it seems like the price and the value of these companies are being, uh, they're suggesting to me that we don't care. We're not going slow enough. We're not taking the proper measures. And it's going so fast, so quickly, that we're going to disrupt maybe perhaps one too many things before we could control them. I'm, une I'm uneasy. That's obviously a very different question from investing itself, but many investors care about ethics. You know, like some investors would not invest in cigarettes for for ethical reason. I'm not saying NVIDIA is un unethical. Don't, don't confuse me. But I am saying that if you took a little bit of a mental, you know, trip, if you imaginary exercise, would you inv invest in the atomic bomb players back in the 50s if that was easily available well i mean i i am now investing in companies like lockheed martin because war seems inevitable and those companies seem like like they're necessary a necessary evil perhaps but this is the state of the world well for not i think i think there are plenty of investors who weigh ethics seriously I'm not making a value judgment in one shape or another. I'm, I think I'm encouraging people to dive deep into these topics so that if you buy something like NVIDIA, you, you have a, a better understanding of the trajectory of the story, where we have been, where we are, and where it's going. And in this moment, it's such, an, it's such a preposterously fast rate of change that's happening that it's bewildering and i think some people just stop at the share price and forget what's you know driving this underneath i mean to me this is like the next well this is happening right now but it's the next industrial revolution right and you know we've just in, we've invented iron or steam or something and we're just just figuring out now how this thing is going to change society that feels like a sustainable investing trend for me I'd say it's probably m more disruptive than the industrial revolution. <clears throat> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's that on steroids because stuff happens so much faster with each iteration. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. You are doing something phenomenal for yourself and for uh, anyone following you on Instagram. You're being a conscientious investor examining your own portfolio starting from what you call the bottom, <laughs> working, working your way to the top. Can you tell us about the motivation behind this process? What, what it is, can you describe it for us and, and what got you to do this? 
yeah so uh and I, th- I think there's a there's a takeaway here for anybody who's a long-term investor or has been investing for a couple of years at least and you've got something to look back at because to me like i love that aphorism if you can measure it you can improve it and like that's kind of a almost like a guiding statement i apply to my entire life like i live my life in spreadsheets um <laughs> I measure everything <laughs> <Literally Uh-oh. everything. laughs> uh, like I hit my new person, I do my new personal best top speed ever on skis a couple of weeks ago, and I've had been measuring it. I wouldn't know what that oh, was. Oh, congratulations! Yeah. Yeah. Seventy-six <laughs> miles an hour. One hundred and six. Seventy-six miles an hour. Yeah. Oh, wait, one hundred seventy-six? No, seventy-six, not one hundred seventy-six. That would be oh, a world record level. Oh, right. 76. No. <laughs> seventy-six is freaking enough. <laughs> seventy-six is freaking enough for me. Trust me. Yeah, holy. It's still pretty damn fast. Yeah. <laughs> um. Uh, and so, yeah, measure everything. And so I have got 20 years plus now of records of every trade I ever did, every buy, sell, trim, add. Um, and and for that last 20 years as well, I've been fairly diligent in at least noting down a couple of, couple of sentences as to why I did that trade, what I was thinking at the time. So I realized maybe five or six years ago, well, actually, here's something I've been measuring and I, I haven't done the analysis on it. So I started you know, generally every couple of years. I think this is probably the third or fourth time I've done this process, but it becomes more diligent each time. I've gone back and looked through my entire trade history and I've looked at like the stuff I sold and what did the stock do afterwards and the stuff I bought and how did it perform. And I'm just trying to draw lessons out of that. And I'm just trying, I'm basically analyzing my own behaviors and trying to figure out how can I improve. And so in the last two years, um, last year and this year, I've realized actually it might be quite fun to do this in public. And I was doing it on just Twitter. And this time I'm having extra fun because I'm doing it on Twitter and Instagram and threads and TikTok and all the rest of them. So what I'm doing is uh, every day, as you say, from my small, currently from my smallest position, which is, I think, new scale power, the uh, small modular reactor guys, up to my very biggest position, which I think I've probably been public in saying is intuitive surgical the uh, medical robots doing surgery i'm going through every stock i own and once a day i'm sharing when did i buy sell add you know how did i actually trade that over the years and i'm trying to draw some insights out so i'll tell you a little bit about each of these companies that i currently own i'm going to do a 50 day challenge so on day 50 i'm going to share my entire portfolio so if you're interested in seeing like what do i actually own in what proportion like come and follow and check it out uh, on day 50. You're going to see that. I've got a bunch of learnings I want to share along the way. Like I'm learning stuff as I do this. And um, I'll give you a couple of examples of things I've learned. Like in 2021, 22, I started building a China sub portfolio. I bought a bunch of companies with the thought that maybe this was a hedge against like erosion of US dominance, you know, perhaps even uh you know, maybe a flippening of the US dollar being like the reserve currency of the world to uh, to China, to Asia somewhere. I got that wrong. Um, and I probably didn't appreciate the extent to which like policy in Asia, particularly in China, was going to impact these stocks. And they're all through the floor, like horrifically so. So um, yeah, so I'm kind of learning stuff by facing into the reality of the mistakes I've made there. And then that's going to help me improve in the future. Let me ask you a, a, a question <clears throat> from a monkey to a badger. It's uh, maybe one of the hardest things that people are faced with is admitting, is looking th- themselves about, about their process objectively and then noticing a mistake and then uh, and that's no small thing, by the way, because it's very tempting to see a mistake and quickly jump past as though it didn't happen. But a- actually noticing it and then actually changing something about your fundamental process. And in part, that's because it's painful. It's literally painful, like whatever our brain chemistry does. Right. You don't get dopamine. You get like you get like skull and crossbones. <laughs> Uh, floating up like oh m- mistake made bad badger bad no you know like and it just feels bad 
to what extent, what do you think you're doing or have been doing as an investor that allows you to complete this process from being motivated enough to do it, actually doing it, and then implementing changes? Um, it's a bit mushy, right? But I think the most important thing is just acknowledging, acknowledging good and bad decisions and then trying to fathom out whether that was like you made a bad decision, but you got lucky or you made a good decision and you got unlucky. You need to sort of get below that level of what actually happened to was this fundamentally a good decision? That's what I'm trying to do. And then it just goes into the mush of if I make a future investing decision, like, for example, um, probably my most recent investment in my main portfolio, and I'm going to be tweeting about it today, was Samsara, ticker IOT. I bought that just two months ago. Um, and when I look at a company, like I go and do some foundational fundamental research and I look at lots of different factors like leadership and market positioning and all this sort of stuff. And I've also got in the back of my mind now the mistakes where I think I've made poor decisions in the past because I'm conscious of it now because I've done this. I'm now doing this kind of annual review and that just that will influence me. So if I think about another learning from one of my investments, um, I talked about it last week on Twitter and TikTok and everywhere. Uh, I invested in Enphase Energy, the solar residential solar and storage company. And like I've lost a fair bit of money on that. And it's because I didn't think hard enough about the effect of higher interest rate environment. I consider that to be my most recent like objective mistake. I, I made a mistake in my process. And so having reflected on that, um, that's now going to be up there. What's happening in macro? Like what is what is the trajectory of interest rates and inflation and how is that going to impact the investment I'm just about to make? I wonder how much of that is hindsight bias. I'm not saying it is necessarily in this case, but it could be because everything's obvious in the rearview mirror. Yep. One thing I'll note though, Badger, is that from my perspective, most investors want quick and easy and they just want to find a ticker and they want to follow somebody else and some work, some don't, and it's kind of casino-like. Right. What you are sharing with people is you're modeling for people what it means to be reflective and self-reflective. So reflective about investments because you do the research, you ask good questions, you go deep but also you're reflecting on your own process, which is really what differentiates humans from all other animals. This is the way to invest, we would say wisely, for the long term with, with principle, this very process. So anyone listening here, uh, apologies for the sermon, but this is not a small thing. It doesn't have to be Badger's process exactly per se, but you really do need to have a process that looks yourself in the, allows you to look yourself in the mirror. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's one thing you can do. There's lots of things you can do. And actually, we share 10 of those. If you go check out wallstreetwildlife.com, and we recently posted a glossy PDF of our 10 laws of the jungle. And I don't know if we talked about sort of doing a review and being reflective. Maybe it's embedded in those laws, but we, we call out 10 specific things you can do and think about if you want to improve your investing processes. I can't, yeah, I can't overstate the importance of what you're modeling for others. So if you have not followed Wall Street Wildlife on Instagram, please do that. And you're, you're going to get one of Luke's companies re, company reviews uh, once a day for the next 50 days. Very good. And, um, and do check us both out on Twitter. You can find me at 7 Luke Hallard, and you can find Christoph at 7 Flying Platypus. All right. So, what's the latest tool in the hacker's arsenal, and why does this make cybersecurity the most durable investing trend of this decade? It really, you maybe you said that unconvincingly. I don't know if you believe that. I no, no, no I, I believe it. I'm just pissed at myself that I sold CrowdStrike. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, that's right. You sold CrowdStrike. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, fascinating anecdote from CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz 
on, I think it was a Morgan Stanley technology conference, come up a level. Like what's happened around cybersecurity in the last month or two that's really actually very interesting and important for investors and for, well, for every company is SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission regulations tightened up. And now if you're a public company, you have to disclose to the SEC, well, to investors, you have to file an 8K um, if you have had a material breach. So you've been attacked in some way by some threat actor, like a bad guy. Mm. And you have to do that within four days of figuring out that you have this issue. So, so to start with, like if cybersecurity wasn't the number one, like a topic you talk about at every board meeting, and you have someone in the room at the board who's informed about this stuff, understands this stuff, and can reassure the board that your company's on top of it, well, you're asking for trouble, right? Every public company mm -hmm. should be doing this now, and I'm sure they are. And if you're even a private company, you're probably a supplier to, like one of your customers is probably a public company. So if they have a problem, they're gonna be asking you hard questions as well, because your, you know, your failure could impact their own operations, mm -hmm. and therefore they have to disclose that. So every company in the world has got to be thinking about this stuff really hard. So this fascinating anecdote from George Kurtz was um, a threat actor uh, managed to hack a public company. And um, I think it was a ransomware attack. And then they tried to demand uh, money to unransom the data, release the data that they'd sequestered. Um, the company refused because they didn't, you, know, you don't want to pay the bad guys. You're just funding terrorism effectively. And so what the threat actor did uh, was they reported the company to the Securities and Exchange Commission because the company had known about this and been debating it with the, with the bad guy for a few weeks and they hadn't disclosed within four days. Mm -hmm. uh, so they get suddenly the company's on the hook for, um, for breaking the regulations. That's incredible, right? So <laughs> these, these guys, the bad guys, are not just attacking these companies. They're now essentially weaponizing uh, these new, this new legislation. Yeah, it, it's not even like good guys, bad guys. It, like it feels like anarchism in in a sense. Like I mean, like this kind of like malevol. It's not even right. It's a force. See, this is what I was talking about AI. Like there's this new force, right? That's just playing. I mean, it's just staggering. But yes, the upshot, right, is is that you you can't be a business without cybersecurity. So it makes all the sense in the world to own a company like CrowdStrike. And CrowdStrike is an expensive company. There's a bunch of other companies. Like I, I tweeted the other day about Palo Alto Networks. Maybe I didn't get to that tweet yet, but it's coming up. Palo Alto Networks, um, like it's the world's biggest pure play cybersecurity company. I own that one too. I know you used to own Sentinel One. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of other companies in this space. Like it's a massive space with literally thousands of suppliers. Um, and But I, I think this is a space where the winners will keep winning so mm -hmm. companies like CrowdStrike, Palo Alto, maybe Fortinet, companies like that are just going to benefit from this massive tailwind of ever increasing regulations and ever more sophisticated and faster threats to business operations. Yeah, and in the age of AI, the rate the rate at which the the attacks will come and the kind I mean it's it, it people now know it, it, there's no uh, this isn't the, the 20s anymore or the, the 10s where, you know, you could be good enough for, for a while and you need the state of the art yeah. unquestionably. So that's why I'll be looking to buy back into a company like CrowdStrike and Zscaler as two examples because they they built their own businesses on the back of the latest technological AI software. Yeah, yeah. CrowdStrike has Charlotte AI, which is essentially it's to try and level up your, if you have like your cybersecurity team in your company, Charlotte AI is like a, a generative AI model to help you understand your own infrastructure and help you deploy CrowdStrike's capabilities. A tiny sidebar, but it is fascinating. Um, like tools like ChatGPT, well, LLMs are making hackers lives easier and faster and just an example like you've got you've got the fate like the big you know publicly accessible llms like perplexity and claude and ChatGPT and gemini but you 
you have versions of these models that are specifically trained and designed to help the hacking community, to help threat actors do their job more effectively. And so what does that mean? It means you could now send like highly targeted, maybe phishing emails to executives within companies. Mm -hmm. And you could do that at massive, massive scale. And because you've got like an LLM helping you drive that, these could be like highly targeted emails. It's not like some, you know, Nigerian letter scam. <laughs> it's like a very sophisticated way of having like a back and forth conversation with thousands of executives at the same time. And if one of them falls for it, well, potentially you've got an entry point to a company and then that's where your ransomware attack starts. Speaking of uh, suspicious emails, I got one the other day from from Prince Badger uh, ask, asking me for some for, for some Bitcoin. He's like, dearest monkey. <laughs> oh, man. I want to ask you uh, whether you made any decisions, active decisions in the portfolio review. I've looked, like I've reinforced a bunch of learnings and I think facing into, like I gave that example of China and of N phase, and there's a bunch of other learnings coming up. I've, okay. I've spreadsheeted out my 50 days, but I haven't written those tweets and I'm going to be thinking about each trade each day. So I'm working so, out four or five days ahead of myself and I know there's a bunch of stuff I've done, which I'll probably come to regret in the future. So let's see if I can learn from those. NVIDIA will be an interesting one because I got in okay. fairly early with that way ahead of the AI hype train, saw it coming. And then I've been managing my exposure by trimming, but I've kind of given up a ton of gains in doing that. So a different way of asking this is there is some company in your portfolio that's number 50, right? It's in last place, new scale, correct? Correct, yep. You reviewed it, are you keeping it? Mm, yeah, I am. Um, are yeah. you adding to it? No. So you're keeping it, but you're not adding to it. 50 companies is a, is a relatively large portfolio, but here you have this one company that's decidedly your, your lowest. And I, I tend to think in binaries, you either add or you sell, but you're just letting it be. What did you learn about looking at that particular company? I'm continuing to hold it. So that is an active decision to hold. Like it's eroded down. I bought it as a 1% position and it's eroded down to a 0.1% position. Um, I think this company is overwhelmingly likely to fail. Um, but there's maybe a, there's a slim, there's maybe a 5% chance that actually they can secure a new commercial customer and they can get to commercial scale. And if they do, it is an easy hundred bagger from today's valuation, maybe more. So I'm, I figure I'm taking a 5% shot at maybe a hundred times on my money. So that adds up. So you're thinking in the risk reward way. Yeah. And so I'd therefore, love, yeah, therefore I would love to have more, more bets like that. I'd love to have like 10 or 20 bets like that. I've probably only got two or three bets like that. So by that rationale, I should take your insight seriously and I should buy 0.1% of this company today or a small a teeny tiny right if i if i wanted to i, I would uh, say you shouldn't you shouldn't shouldn't look at anything another investor does and just go like copy what they do um but yeah, i've done yeah. i feel like i've done my foundational research on this company i understand enough about this industry it's i'm not uh it's it's so immaterial to my overall portfolio today that i'm no longer going to track it so i'm just not watching it but if, this, if I look at my portfolio at some point in the future and this thing is like back to a 1% position because it's getting there, it's actually up 23% today, um, so, then, then I'll start to pay attention again. Let me rephrase the question. Forget me. Hmm. If you did not own it today, right. by that rationale, you would go out into the open market and you would buy it. Uh, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's implicit in what I'm saying. Yeah, that's, that's a reasonable way to state it. Yeah. And you would buy this teeny tiny amount? I'd probably buy a little bit more, but uh, like I do have transaction costs when I invest. So there is that, right? Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So you're would, not would... facing, so it's not the, in, it's not the problem of inertia because you've already owned it. It's better to just leave it. You would knowing what you know, given the research you've done, the self-reflection, you are confident enough 
about the risk reward uh, ratio here that if you did not own it, you would actively go out and buy it. Yes, I would. Uh, yes. Probably a half a percent position. And I'd, lo- I'd like to look for other ones in those. The transaction costs are such that it's probably just not worth my while to do like a 0.4% to bring it back up to a half a percent. So why not to go to 1% just too risky? Yeah, I, th- I think I think they're, they're much riskier than when I first bought them. Yeah, they're, they're far less likely to succeed. I may have given them like a 10% chance of succeeding. It's now sub 5%, I think. Okay. All right, well, that's really insightful. Okay, right, cool. cool. And I, I don't own 50 things, but I am going to reflect on some stuff that I was a previous owner of at some point in the 50-day oh, right. journey. Like, for example, Netflix, which I got into, I think, just as they were pivoting to from like DVDs by mail to um, online. And I think I saw quite early that that was going to be like a winning business model. And that was probably one of the, well, certainly the best investing decision I ever made in my life and I'm ever likely to make was my first purchase of Netflix. Mm -hmm. Because that first purchase is a 250 bagger, I think. Mm -hmm. You don't get many of those in an investing lifetime. Right. Although with the AI uh, world that we're entering, who, who's to say? The world's right. about to change radically. It is. It's changing radically. Maybe there are other 250 baggers in my portfolio today that, that are yet to do, reveal themselves. All right. Good discussion as ever, Christoph. Hopefully we answered those three big questions. We'll try and do this in future episodes. We'll try and orient our discussions around a big question for investors. You can find us on YouTube and all major podcast platforms. Subscribe now for a finance podcast that's as fun and playful, hopefully, as it is insightful. And you can also find us at wallstreetwildlife.com. And that's where you can get that shiny PDF that Badger and Monkey put together called The Laws of the Jungle, which condense all our or a lot of our long-term wisdom about investing it's free so check it out uh christoph and i are also both lead advisors at seveninvesting.com go check it out uh if you get on if you're interested in subscribing if you use coupon code wildlife you can get a handsome discount but maybe even better than that just pay one dollar for a one-week trial and check out nearly 200 different stock recommendations and a ton of foundational research on some of the world's greatest companies today. Are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.